All right, everybody, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's COVID-19 uh, Professional Education Quick and R. Um, this is a, a new event that the ESRD NCC is going to be conducting. This is our first one, and we are very, very happy that those of you who are on the line have taken the time to join us for today's event. Um, so before we turn things over to our speaker who is on the line with us, uh, we want to talk a little bit about what this call is about. Um, I, I will tell you a little bit about our speaker before we turn things over to him. Uh, his topic today is going to be pivoting to telehealth in the dialysis setting. And then when it's all said and done, we should have a few minutes left over for questions and answers that you submit from the chat and the Q&A panels. Now, I'm going to strongly suggest that we submit questions in the Q&A panel. We expect a lot of folks to be on the line here today. And if you send it through chat, it might get lost. In the Q&A panel, we'll have a better chance of getting to your question or finding your question easier. And uh, we won't have time to answer them all, of course, but we'll answer some of the more key pertinent ones that we can today uh, before we end our event at 5.30. This is only a 30-minute event, so we're going to move quickly today. Uh, so uh, what is this call about? Uh, this is a new opportunity uh, that from CMS and from the NCC where we're getting to hear from stakeholders in the community about the things that they're doing that are adapting their practices or their, uh, their best practices, their strategies to, to adjust to this COVID-19 situation that we're all facing. Um, so we'd like to provide some real world strategies that our attendees can put into use in their facilities if they apply to them. Um, and so it's really just a chance for us to engage in these weekly calls. There will be varying topics. Uh, we're going to start announcing uh, more and more speakers in, in the coming days. Uh, but this is what this call is all about, and we hope that you'll continue to join us um, as these calls are announced and released. Um, so before I turn things over to, uh, to our, our speaker, let me introduce him. Uh, Dr. Christos Argaropoulos joins us today from the University of New Mexico. And he, again, he's talking about pivoting to telehealth. And he's worked at UNM since 2014 and has served as the Division Chief of Nephrology since 2017. Uh, he's also been the Chair of the Medical Review Board for ESRD Network 15 uh, since 2019. Now his clinical work focuses on diabetic kidney disease and kidney transplant and outreach nephrology. Uh, he's also the, currently the medical director for two dialysis clinics in rural New Mexico, where he's overseeing the in-center and the home dialysis programs for these facilities. Uh, it's my great pleasure to turn things over to Dr. Christos. Are you there, sir? Yes, Matt. <clears throat> Thank you for the introduction. So um, I guess uh, we'll just talk about our very early experience being experienced people being to telehealth for in-center dialysis. Next slide, please. I'd like to put some things on the map to show where our practice is and how uh, important telehealth is for us in the next, uh, is going to be in the next few months. So this is actually the map of New Mexico. The red dot in the middle is where the university and where our largest dialysis unit is uh, situated. And the blue dots on the map are, are the all the other dialysis units we go to. So. If you were to take that clinic from the north all the way down to the clinic in the south, that's about eight or nine hours of driving if you do it as a straight shot. So there's a lot of driving that we do on regular business uh, days. And unfortunately, COVID has made it or will make it a lot more difficult for us to care for our patients. Next slide, please. So the background and how we got into the pivoting was uh, our, um, you know, a need that uh, came about very suddenly. So the last week, actually, of uh, March, not May, there's a typo over there. Um, three out of the ten nephrologists in our practice, including myself, were uh, considered five for COVID-19. We got exposed. Um, taking care of patients in the hospital and in the CK clinic. Around that time, the turnaround time for tests was about six days. Um, and uh, our practice, uh, which manages two hospitals, one transplant program, and a bunch of other clinics, was kind of strapped of finishing the evaluations for the in, uh, for the in center patients. Around that time, the government had issued a shelter at home order, which means that many other things were not happening. And to 
uh, the icing on the cake is that many of our staff, uh, providers, and nephrologists are shared among my, our many of our facilities. So really, last week, we had this acute issue of having to finish the evaluation for our patients, conclude some of the transplant programs, do the or, or wrap up the monthly com comprehensive assessments, and just take, take care of patients. We were hearing from the dialysis units that as a result of the shelter at home and the need to provide uh, services to the COVID patients, uh, they were very concerned we were not going to be able to see them. And uh, exactly that day was the day that uh, CMS released the TSRD document, which essentially made it very easy for everybody to people to telehealth. Um, so we decided to uh, try this in one of our units about 100 miles from Albuquerque and see how the patients would be receptive and how we are actually going to do it. Next slide, please. So uh, as a background, because we are a rural state, we have Zoom accounts to the university, which have been provided for us in case we wanted to set up uh, telehealth programs. Um, it should be mentioned that the Medicaid programs uh, at New Mexico have one of the most uh, favorable approaches to telehealth than any other insurance program around the nation. So a lot of um, a lot of divisions and departments are actually actively using telehealth. So we had those accounts, so we just basically activated them and decided to use them for uh, center in center rounds. So. We sat down with the nurse manager of the clinic that we used to pilot this, and we agreed that we're going to set a two-hour telecession per shift. This is one of our smaller clinics. It has about 30 patients, so we figure that two hours should be enough to see about 15 patients uh, per shift. Um, we asked the nurse manager to specify uh, the time she would uh, feel comfortable doing those rounds. Um, and uh, since we have a very um, sort of uh, tight control of the schedules, she knew exactly when her downtime would be during each shift. Um, so she told us the time, we set up the Zoom invitation, we emailed her the invitation to her and other members of the multidisciplinary team who wanted to be there. Um, and uh, we asked uh, the clinic to use the laptops that we use for the regular rounds um, to uh, receive the Zoom invitation. So as part of our usual routine when rounding at DCI units, we have laptops that we mount on uh, like trays on wheels and we go around from patient to patient, entering uh, data, writing prescriptions. So the laptops would serve uh, as our uh, way to interact with the patients. The meeting itself was entirely run over the facility Wi-Fi, so we didn't need any special IT infrastructure or nodes to uh, communicate. Uh, at the time that we did this, we had we had no time to obtain a consent. And in fact, if you read uh, the various documents that uh, CMS released about consent for telehealth, they specify that consent can be obtained uh, after the fact. And this is something that we're going to be doing this month obtain the consents from the patients. Next slide. So the distance side and the infrastructure to do this, not at the dialysis facility, of the distance side, we piloted two different configurations. Uh, one of the configurations just used um, a computer with an ultra-wide monitor, so we divided the screen up to two. Uh, on the left on the left hand, we put the zoom um, on the right hand, we put the DCI electronic uh, health record, and this allowed us to quickly flip through uh, writing orders, um, issuing prescriptions um, or doing the notes. Uh, the second configuration that we that we tried that day was uh, a separate, two different computers, a laptop for the Zoom, and a second computer where we just um, activated the dialysis uh, EMR. And the reason we tried both configurations is that we wanted to make sure that uh, running um, the, the Citrix bridge, which we use to connect to the EMR, is not going to create any issues with the, um, uh, 
with the video conferencing. In fact, there was like both platforms worked equally well. So depending on what you have available, you can use. So the actual rounds was uh, the process was fairly straightforward. So the nurse manager put the computer on the on the tray, and she went from station to station, verifying the patient identification with us, like the date of birth, reviewed vitals, physical exam findings, uh, in particular whether the patient's lungs were clear, whether there was edema, what was going on with the access. We had to uh, execute uh, a particular maneuver in which we mainly interacted with the patient, so the laptop was facing uh, the patient. And at the end, after we had finished uh, interacting with the patient, she would uh, turn the tray so we have a view of the dialysis screen and some crit lines that were running the same day. Um, it was interesting uh, that even though we had patients who were in, wearing masks that day because they had common colds, not COVID, most of the issue, there were no issues communicating with them. Um, but you may be uh, cognizant to the fact that some patients may be hearing impaired. So if you have somebody who wears a hearing aid, you want to make sure that they have that on the same day. Um, a couple of days later, we did home dialysis rounds uh, in a similar fashion. But since we were interacting with patients at home, most of them told us that they don't don't want to be using Zoom. They suggested using FaceTime or Google. So we complied uh, to this request. And it's very, uh, very fortunate that CMS had allowed these uh, non HIPAA compliant platforms to be used during the emergency. Next slide. So what were the summary of the observations? Um, we finished the rounds at the over the same time frame as the face-to-face -face rounds. Um, so using the telehealth uh, platform did not increase or did not decrease the time, the usual time it takes to round uh, in some patients. Um, most of the patients were actually pleasantly surprised to uh, see me. I was the one doing the pilot because they thought that they would not uh, be visited for a second time that month because of all the COVID uh, emergencies. I do have to say that uh, we reassure them that the face-to-face -face visits will take place only if they feel comfortable doing this. And in response to these uh, national, well, actually global emergencies, and we will most definitely not be doing them if we think that there is an unstable condition that requires a face-to-face -face evaluation. Interestingly enough, when we discuss those observations with our group, some of our, of our more senior nephrologists expressed concerns about not seeing their patients. So they said that they would prefer to continue rounding in the same fashion, like face-to-face. And uh, this is this is fine. The only reason we're doing telehealth is to uh, make th things in life easier on everybody. Um, the consensus among our group, and this goes back to us being a rural unit, a, a rural program, is that we won't be using telehealth to increase the frequency of visits. For many of our units, we are only able to go twice a month because we have to provide other services um, like CKD clinics. And it's very difficult to be out of home for six or seven days in the month. So most of these rural clinics are visited twice a month. And the initial experience is that you can round with them, with this, you can round on the patients in the same frequency and get the exact same information. So we won't be using uh, these. Uh, uh, telehealth visits, do more visits. Um, it's also worth pointing out that some of our patients brought this uh, up themselves and they said, okay, since you don't have to drive three hours one way to see us, maybe you, you can uh, see us more frequently this way. And we are evaluating this request because um, we are not using this to sort of do more. We're just using this to do our work in the middle of an emergency. Um, the home dialysis 
patients were almost unanimous in their preference for alternative platforms, whether it was a phone call or FaceTime or some other um, video chat application. And I think this needs to be taken into account um, after the COVID era when we start evaluating all the lessons learned uh, from this period. Next slide. All right, so that was my end of the presentation. Thank you for uh, logging in today, and it's open for questions. Great, thank you, Dr. Christos. We do have a couple of questions coming in, um, and I have a few questions of my own, um, but I did get a question that came in, um, and, and I'll just read it to you verbatim. We had one social worker in a home program who had asked if, if it would be okay to use the telephone only if a patient refused to do any form of video like FaceTime or Hangouts or Zoom. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think the regulations that the CMS released are kind of very specific. You can use almost anything, to be honest. So, to, and in fact, for our, many of our home patients were only doing phone now because they some of the older patients who live alone don't have like smartphones. So I think it's acceptable provided there is buying from both parties. Very good, very good, thank you. Um, so one question that, um, that I have, we talked about using Zoom at first, um, and there's been some uh, news articles or whatnot about concerns about Zoom security or whatnot. Did you have any issues in your experience with anything that's, you know, we've been reading about in the news? Uh, and if not, do you have any general tips for Zoom users to make this type of visit more um, engaging or effective? Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting that the only platform that's considered HIPAA compliant has security concerns. But to be honest, any platform will will end up having some sort of a security concern. Um, so if somebody really wants to get your data, they can get it no matter what. We, the only thing you can do is just reduce the risk of this uh, happening. So um, as I said, things that we try to do is to make, is make sure you split the platform so don't have the EMR and the Zoom running on the same computer if that's feasible. So you can use a tablet for the Zoom and like a regular computer. Um, you, you can possibly can possibly using a secure Wi-Fi. So if you there are like hotspots that you can get from the cellular carriers and then you can use some sort of a password authentication to log into those. Uh, these are issues that you can discuss uh, with one security, um, IT security. Um, tips for new Zoom users. Obviously we all became super users in the last couple of, well, three weeks or so. Um, <laughs> the platform is reasonably easy to use, make sure that you <laughs> you put a, you know, a neutral background. So Zoom itself has like those digital backgrounds that you can use and they're actually fairly, um, you can customize them, you can use a different picture uh, if you don't want people to see your wife or kid running around <laughs> behind you. <laughs> um, I think it's important to uh, for the for the uh, for the originating side to have a laptop with uh, good speakers and uh, a microphone. So there are directional microphones which look like smaller versions of the octopuses. We do video conferencing. These are available for like fifty or seventy dollars. If you can secure those, then you can have better audio. Sometimes we didn't experience those issues, but other colleagues who are doing telehealth for regular clinics have pointed out that this equipment may be a little bit better, or you may consider a higher end speaker that you can buy for $15 if the laptop speakers are not loud enough. So I think this would be the major technical um, comments I would have. 
good, good. Thank you. That makes that makes total sense. Thank you. Um, this is an interesting question we received. Um, what what is the census at your center? And, and the reason this question was asked was, what effect did this have on the nurse manager and their time? Uh, and, and a follow up question to that is, how many more patients do you think you could add into this telehealth uh, approach at that facility? Yeah. So, well, both are good questions. So. The facility that we run the pilot on has about 13 patients, 15 patients per shift. So it usually takes me about an hour and 20 minutes to do rounds on them. And I try not to do any charting during the rounds, so basically just face-to-face -face time, exams, medications, review of flow sheets, and stuff like that. So the nurse manager is part of our, our usual rounds. So Having her do the telehealth with us, it was just a matter of doing, I mean, uh, devoting the same amount of time that she would normally devote to us. Um, now, if you have a really big dialysis unit, and some of our units, you know, have like 35 to 40 stations, then it becomes kind of interesting because I don't think, and I, I don't think, but I haven't tried uh, actually to do rounds on a single, uh, like round on one of these big shifts uh, in the same day. So we may want to split uh, the rounds to two or more days. Um, because uh, you're right, the major problem is that you can't tie up the nurse manager for more than what you usually tie her up for. So um, I think you can possibly go up to 25 patients, but after that, it may get difficult to do and you will have to split the days. Very good, very good. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, we've got about five minutes left for questions and I've got, it looks like about six questions in queue here. So we're gonna try to get through them as best we can, but if we can't, um, you know, we'll do as much as we can. Um, for home PD patients, are you still requiring these patients to come in for monthly labs or are you just doing a telehealth visit without labs? So uh, most of our patients actually come for labs and we felt that this would be a good way to keep track of them. Uh, so yeah, the patients do come in for labs. We actually had a second question related to that too, so you just answered both of them. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so here's another question. Any ideas how a facility can provide telehealth documentation if they do not have an EMR system? Okay, so that's actually a very good question. Um, so, uh, <laughs> and we, we did partly that because I don't know how, if people are familiar with the uh, EMR system for DCI, but it has a facility, uh, built into it to print a single page summary of all the labs. That's called an encounter uh, flow sheet, which is essentially a snapshot of all the labs that the patient seen. So in another facility that was surrounded yesterday, uh, the clinician had a hard time accessing the EMR for whatever reason. Uh, not entirely clear what happened because all of us were at the same, accessing that EMR at the same time. Uh, and he asked the nurse manager to print those encounters and send them by secure email. So essentially what he did is he had those, he printed those forms, filled them out, and then scanned them and sent them back by secure email. So I think this, this is the way for a facility that doesn't have the EMR to do things, like scan or fax everything to the clinician, and then if there is anything else that needs to be done, uh, the clinician can sign and send back via a uh, secure email. Very good, thank you. Um, let me scan through, we got, um, so here's a question about telehealth, uh, specifically as it relates to um, AKI patients and unstable patients. What are your thoughts on uh, telehealth working for those uh, two types of patients? So very good question. So if you read the CMS a document that was released last week, the patient has to be clinically stable and there's no definition in that document that's left up to the clinician to decide uh, before uh, you can uh, waive the face-to-face -face encounter. 
So um, for our acute kidney injury and patients who have unstable, clinically unstable or unstable care plans, we already made the decision as to we're going to continue face-to-face -face encounters. And many of the clinics will do at least one face-to-face -face encounter per month uh, until to the point where we hit the surge for New Mexico. And at that time, everybody's going to be called in the hospital, take care of COVID patients, and then there will be no face-to-face -face visits. So for this particular two patients, I think um, we should continue the face-to-face -face because there is a risk. I mean, if they're clinically unstable, there is some information from exam that you may not be able to get through a third person. Right. Very good. That makes sense. Um, I think we have time for about two more questions before we have to wrap up. Um, this, I, you kind of touched on this uh, in, in terms of patient opposition, but did any patient um, specifically express any privacy concerns in discussing their health care um, over an electronic ca connection like a Zoom or a, or a Hangouts or whatnot? Uh, so to answer your question, no, but we practice in a rural area and many of the patients are used to picking up the phone and talking to us remotely. So I don't know if that played any role. And it's also a state where there's a lot of telehealth anyway. So many people are used to this type of communications. I don't know how it would play out in the metropolitan area, but none of our patients said that anything. Negative. And I think we have time for one more. Uh, this question is about uh, prescriptions. How did, how did you manage providing uh, medication or prescriptions? Um, does this system allow you to send those prescriptions electronically? Uh, Zoom itself will not allow you to send prescriptions electronically. And uh, in fact, we have uh, a dual system for, for these patients. So they, they tend to have a, a medical record number. Actually, they all have a medical record number in the provider practice EMR, which is different from the dialysis EMR. And we just like send prescriptions electronically through that platform. For those patients uh, who are using a pharmacy that's not tied to the electronic prescription system, we just uh, call things in. You know, back to the 90s when we were using the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Christos, that's been very, very helpful. Uh, we just want to thank you for your time again. Uh, this has been a very interesting presentation. Um, and if we, uh, if we have any other questions, um, are, would it be okay to email them to you if we've got um, you know, one that stands out? Absolutely. Wonderful, sir. Thank you again so much for your time. And uh, we have a couple slides here to wrap up. Um, the first thing we want to do is tell you about our next call. Uh, that's going to be Wednesday. That is Wednesday, April 15th. Uh, and next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to have David Arietta on, uh, who's the Chief Financial and Operating Officer from Nephrology Associates out of Nashville. Um, and he's going to be talking to us about operationalizing telehealth at the nephrology practice. Um, so there's a link on that slide. Uh, if you go to that, that address, esrdncc.org slash en, yada, yada, you can register for those events. And as we add new events, that is going to be the landing page for all of the events that we have, both for our, our professional education series and our patient education series. Um, so give that site a visit, bookmark it, check back frequently. We're going to have some really interesting uh, sessions coming up in the next week, two, three, however long um, we are in this, this new land that we're dealing with. Um, so we just want to say thank you for attending our session. Um, our contact information is on the screen. We've also got some additional resources for patients and provider through the uh, Kidney uh, Community Espo Re Emergency Response site, caserecoalition.com. And over on the CDC site, if you've not been over there, please get over there as fast as you can. I have a wonderful page with coronavirus resources, uh, extremely useful. Um, so that's going to do it for today. It's 5.30. We're going to end on time. I want to say thank you to everybody who took time out of your afternoon to join us, and we certainly hope that we will see you on our uh, event next week. Thank you so much for joining us, and have a wonderful afternoon.